In this video, we're going to apply our analysis of first and second derivative information to a specific function and a fairly complicated function and use that information to get to a sketch of the function itself. The idea is we can understand functions better if we know information about when are they increasing and decreasing, when are they concave up and concave down. Now to accomplish this, we need to calculate the first derivative and the second derivative. We'll start with the first derivative, noting that we need to apply the quotient rule here. Derivative of the top times the bottom minus the top unchanged times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. Now we're gonna be building a sign chart, which is an indication of when the first derivative or second derivative are positive and negative. To accomplish that, it helps to have this factored as fully as possible. So what we're gonna do here is note that we have x squared minus two x squared, that's minus x squared over all, and we have a plus one, and we have the denominator unchanged. What we can write that as though is one minus x squared. Now that's a handy way to write it for calculations, but if we're interested in the signs, it's gonna be much more useful to know that this is a difference of squares, one minus x and one plus x, if we multiply that out, will give us one minus x squared, and then leave the denominator the same. Now building a sign chart for this involves drawing a real line, and then looking at the constituents of the first derivative. People have different strategies for this. I'll demonstrate one way that you can accomplish this calculation. So we put some landmarks in here, and we talk about the individual terms, one minus x, and let's put the bottom one in here as well. We'll make a note about it in a second. And then the combined function up at the top. I like to do it this way with the ingredients down here and then the final result up here. If we take a look at one plus x, where does it change signs? Well, it changes signs at x equals negative one. Let's put that here. So up to here, if I had a negative number one below negative one for x, I'd end up with a negative value. And then as soon as I transition past negative one, I'm gonna have positive values from there on in. If x is five, I'll have five plus one is positive. If I have zero, zero plus one is positive. All along this interval here, we're gonna have positive values. Similarly, one minus x, well, where does it transition? It transitions when this equals zero or when x equals one. So that's another important landmark. And if we draw a line for that, when x is bigger than 1, like 2, 3, 4, 5, we're going to get a negative value for this. But when x is a negative number, we'll have 1 minus a negative. That would be a positive over all. So we're going to have positive values on this interval. And last but not least, we note that x squared plus 1. We're squaring x. It's always going to be positive, especially the plus 1. Even if we had a 0, we'd have 1 added to it. This thing is positive everywhere positive everywhere. How does that help us determine the sign of the first derivative? Well, if we look at any point along here, we're going to have a negative times a positive times a positive. That will give us a negative first derivative on that interval. However, when we transition to the point or through the point negative one on this open interval, in fact, all the way up to one here, zero isn't that important in this scenario, from negative one to one, all three of these products are going to be positive. And then last but not least, once we get past one, we're going to have a positive times a negative times a positive. We're going to go back to a negative first derivative again. So let's actually move that first derivative up so that we see what these signs capture is a sign of the first derivative. Already that gives us an idea of what the function looks like. It's decreasing until negative one, and then it's gonna be increasing and then decrease again afterwards, after x equals positive one. That's the first derivative information. Let's take a look at the second derivative. We're going to start with this formula for our first derivative and take a second derivative of that. So there's our first derivative again. Our second derivative is then going to be the derivative of the top, negative two x, times the bottom minus the top unchanged times the derivative of the bottom. We have to be careful here. The two is gonna come down front. We're going to have an x squared plus one again to the one, but then we also need the chain rule, so we're going to multiply by another two x, all over 
the denominator we had before, which was this squared. We're gonna have that squared, which will give us a fourth power. All right, that is not a trivial second derivative, but we can do some tidying up. In particular, we see that both the top terms have an x squared plus one to some power. So we can cancel one of those from each of those terms, and that will leave us with only three x squared plus ones in the denominator. We're also looking for as many common factors as we can get. So I see a two x in both of these. So let's gather those out front and I'm gonna bring a negative inside. So we'll have negative x squared and the negative plus one is negative one. And what else do we have? We have a two, we have a negative two and we have a negative, negative x squared is positive times two. So a positive x squared and this two x was factored out front all over x squared plus one cubed. Now that we can definitely tidy up. I have a little typo, this is two x squared. So we have positive x squared, two of them, a negative one. We're ending up with two x times an x squared minus three, perfect. So that is the second derivative of our function. Again, we can actually factor this term here because it's a difference of squares, the three isn't a nice square, but we can write this out as x minus root three and x plus root three. And once we have this factored form, we can look at the sign of each of these ingredients. So with that in mind, let's look at the two x, the x minus root three, the x plus root three, and the x squared plus one all cubed. If we take a look at a real line for each of these, we will get that two x is positive when x is positive and negative when x is negative. For x minus root three, I'll need a bigger x. I'll need to say go out to root three here and then that'll be positive. But if you have anything that's less than root three, well, that's gonna be negative. X plus root three has the same kind of picture except the transition is at negative root three if we put anything from zero on, this will be positive. Even if some small negative numbers, this will be positive. That matches that. And last but not least, we have a cube, so it could change sign here, but x squared plus one is always positive, no matter what. And let's put that together into our second derivative. We had the three transition points at the root three, negative, zero, and positive root three. And if we scan in this interval, we had a negative, a negative, a triple negative, and let's be careful here, this is a positive. So three negatives makes a negative. On this interval, we had a negative, negative, oh, and then we're in the positive, so it goes positive overall. You can kind of see where this is going. Here we have positive, negative, positive, positive, that'll be negative overall. And in the last interval, everything's positive. So that is one way to do a sign chart for the first and second derivatives. What does it tell us about the function? Well, let's see if we can sketch out what we have here. Let's take advantage of one easy point, which is when x is equal to zero, we get zero over one, we get zero. So we actually know a starting point in addition to all the first and second derivative information. Going back a page, negative one and one are landmarks. The function is decreasing, then increasing, then decreasing around there. So let's mark those, negative one, plus one on those intervals, we know what's happening, increasing, decreasing, and decreasing. What do we know about the concavity? Well, we have that around negative root three, which is a little bit to the left here. Let's call that negative root three. It's a little bit bigger than one. And on those intervals, and including zero, it's a bit different, we have first concave down, let's put C, and then C up, concave up. Then on this interval, it's concave down. And last but not least, from the rest of the function, it's going to be concave up. So what will that look like? We have our anchor point here at zero. We know the function is increasing, so it's gonna be going up, and it's going to be concave down. So what does that look like? Increasing, but concave down. It does that until x equals one. That's when we switch from increasing to decreasing, but it's still concave down for a bit. 
So we're gonna have it concave down until we reach the end of that interval there. And then it's still decreasing, but concave up. Now it could go down further, we don't really know. I'll just sketch it out like this. But here we see the transition of increasing and then decreasing afterwards. We see the concave down for the first part and then concave up afterwards. And if we repeat that same kind of behavior, uh, if we're increasing, we're sliding into this function here like so. That would be increasing all the way up to there. That satisfies our first derivative. Then it has to be decreasing after or earlier than that. We still want to keep concave up for a bit longer though. On this whole interval, we should have concave up. We do. And then we go to concave down. So it might look like that. And so with that information, we can get a very detailed sketch of the shape of this function. We don't know quite where these asymptotes might occur. It looks like it's going to have an asymptote. We don't know where that's going to happen. In fact, I think if we do some calculus later on, we'll see that it actually flattens out towards x equals zero. But we have the overall shape of the function simply by working with the first and second derivatives. It's a very powerful technique for understanding the shapes of functions.